as people are joining us tonight. Good evening, everybody. My name is Megan Kammer, and I am the assistant curator here at the VAC. I want to welcome you all to our virtual evening today and briefly share a little bit about this program um, for those of you who are joining us at home. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Visual Arts Center of Clarington is situated on the traditional territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. Um, our work on these land acknowledge acknowledges the signatory communities of the Williams Treaties. We also recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. We express our gratitude and recognize our responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live, work, and create. And we thank our neighbors for their resilience and their longstanding contributions to the area that we now know as the Durham region. Um, we in the VAC also wish to acknowledge and inform our audiences about the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism, land theft, genocide, and anti-Black racism in Canada. We believe the systems and the um, individual beneficiaries who continue to espouse the logics of these issues and deny their complicity must be abolished. We um, encourage you to bring these truths to light at all levels possible in your own communities. Um, this can go anywhere from protesting, donating, signing petitions, exercising your right to vote at all levels, and self-educating about the ongoing impacts of colonialism, sexual bigotry, and anti-Black racism. I believe these acknowledgments are not to commemorate the past, but to recognize our ongoing commitment as a municipal institution to the present and the future. They really are living and will continue to live in all of us. So tonight's session is being recorded for those of us who are unable to join live today. Um, if you're at home and are having trouble with the view, I recommend changing your settings to gallery view. This will allow you to see all of our speakers all at once. Um, we also will be opening the floor to a Q&A near the end of our session. So I encourage you to place all comments and questions in the chat below as we go along and we'll be returning to them at the end of the night. Um, tonight, I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by three wonderful artists, curators, and activists who will be chatting with us about our final exhibition of the 2021 season here at the VAC, Bodies in Conflict, um, specifically the work of our featured artist, Keon Williams, as the exhibition officially comes to a close today. I'll begin in alphabetical order by introducing our speakers. Um, first up is Courtney McFarlane, a Jamaican-born visual artist, curator, and poet whose literary work has been published in various African, Canadian, and queer anthologies. They are a founding member of many groups that have become forerunners in providing voice and visibility to Black queer issues here in Canada. Their curatorial practice often seeks to unearth stories of political organization and cultural activism um, from these communities in Toronto. They created Legacies in Motion, Black Queer Archival Projects in 2019 and have since exhibited with the Band Gallery as well as other curatorial projects with Myseum Toronto and TD. Our second speaker, Olu Sheye, is the second speaker joining us tonight. As a Nigerian-Canadian artist, his multidisciplinary practice explores painting, photography, performance, and sculpture to reinforce African rituals and philosophies as living, complex, and valid traditions of Black consciousness. He has exhibited at the Art Gallery of Ontario, Gallery 151 in New York, and Art 21 in Lagos, Nigeria. You can also currently see their work on display at Mocha Toronto's current 2020, GTA 2021 exhibition, which I highly recommend checking out before it closes um, this upcoming January on the 30th. And last, though certainly not least, is Keon Williams. Williams is a visual artist and writer from Newark, New Jersey, who works fluidly across performance, sculpture, video, and 2D realms. They earned a um, BA with honors from Stanford University and an MFA in visual art from Columbia. Their work has been exhibited at the Jewish Museum, um, the Brooklyn Museum, Socrates Sculpture Park, The Shed, and others. 
William's sculptural work has been featured with us here at the VAC for the last few months in our main gallery exhibition, Bodies in Conflict. Um, in this show, the artist mediates on the body as an assemblage and entanglement of many forms of matter, plant life, earth, light, and how it endures, transforms, decays, and regenerates amidst different social and environmental shifts. So thank you all, and I welcome you, and I'm going to hand it off to our speakers. Thank you so much, Megan, um, and welcome, Kian Olushe, and um, all the folks who have joined us uh, virtually here on Zoom. Um, Kian, since you know your your work um, currently on exhibition as part of the Bodies in Conflict show at the VAC is what brings us together um, in conversation. Could you talk a bit about that work for those who haven't had a chance to see it, um, or those who have? Tell us about, about the, the work that's on exhibit right now. Absolutely. Um, before I begin, I just want to say um, thank you both for being in conversation um, today. Um, I'm so thrilled for us to be able to just, um, for me at least as an artist, to connect with other artists in a different sort of um, <clears throat> uh, context than I'm in and sort of think through sort of some of the gestures and ideas um, that kind of transcend national borders and boundaries. Um, and thank you, of course, to Visual Arts Center for being such great hosts and stewards of this work, which was one of my first post-pandemic um, in-person exhibitions, which makes it particularly special. Um, so I'm going to share an image um, of the work that is on display in Bodies and Conflicts as I talk about it so that folks have a visual reference. Um, so to describe it, it's three sculptural forms um, that are loosely inspired by um, different geological um, forms that I've encountered in um, some of my travels um, throughout the US and the Caribbean to kind of source inspiration and um, engage in this sort of method of uh, research that is central to my practice um, in which I've um, gone on this sort of sojourn, this journey to retrace my ancestors' migration to um, the continent to the United States, specifically the Northeast, New York and New Jersey, where my family um, most immediately is from and where I was born. Um, and that's taken me to different sites in the American South in Virginia and North Carolina. Um, that's taken me to Puerto Rico and St. Croix. And in all of these journeys, I've been, um, I guess, motivated by asking myself these kind of like big sort of sort of existential questions. Who are you? How did you get here? Who are your people from? Or where are your people from? Who are your people? Um, as it's, uh, which is a complicated question given sort of the context of Black American diasporic experience and Black diasporic experience, um, you know, in general being descendant of people um, who were kidnapped um, and trafficked um, to the United States. And so in these various journeys and migrations to different um, places in the sort of global north and the western hemisphere, um, in my attempts to answer these questions, I've often, you know, am encountered, you know, by gaps and, um, and, um, and, unresolved sort of encounters in which, you know, using census records, I go to places that were formerly um, places where some of my forebears lived or were from and would encounter like quite literally, um, you know, ruins. Um, and so this is an image that I took in 2019 um, in St. Croix. Um, and so, when I visit these sites, sometimes there are like no traces, no evidence of 
my, you know, the people I'm from. And so I began to collect the debris and the earth from these sites, um, thinking about them as, you know, an archive embedded, embedded with historical memory um, that sort of hold the traces of the lives of the people who once inhabited or walked across these different sites that I'm interested in. Um, and I bring them back to my studio in New York and make these sort of geological forms that um, um, made of, you know, earth. And in this context, some of the, one of the sculptures in the back has like some like moss and other organic matter that I collected. And I kind of just assemble them into what, what I think of as these kind of fragile forms that appear to be like suspended in time that appear to be, um, you know, really fragile, although they are, you know, um, very structurally sound and sturdy. Um, and these are kind of like a distillation and, uh, you know, me kind of translating um, uh, these sort of encounters I'm having with history, with ruins, um, with, you know, social and environmental shifts that um, inform who and how I experience my world um, presently in a contemporary. Um, and so I often finish some of these forms by um, including, you know, casts of my of like different body parts, in this case, my head, um, and including them onto these otherwise like kind of amorphous shapes as a way to sort of um, think about how I see myself and my own existence sort of implicated and as a part of, um, you know, the, 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 the lives and the memory of the materials that I'm working with. And so, um, yeah, these are the three form sculptures and they're installed in a bed of, um, of earth um, such that they appear to kind of be emerging out of or perhaps returning to the earth. And is this is this local soil that was uh, that was used in in this piece? It's always a mix. Um, so the soil, um, the soil that the sculptures are made out of um, are a mix of like you know soil that I source from around my studio, soil that I collect from um, some of my like you know my journeys and trips that. Um, that I go on um, to specifics like ruins or sites of significance. Mm -hmm. um, and then the soil that's on the ground is all soil that um, the really lovely curator or former curator um, who organized the exhibition, Matthew, um, sourced for me um, in order to um, realize the installation. And what was your, what brought you to St. Croix? What, what's your connection to St. Croix? Great question. So my great, great grandmother is um, uh, uh, from St. Croix and moved, uh, migrated in the 1930s, no, in the, uh, in like 1919 um, to New York City. Um, and so that's one of the sort of, I that I've, or places that I've traced my ancestry to and have returned to on this sort of journey to attempt to connect with or learn more about, you know, my past. It's interesting. I mean, as somebody who sort of is interested in archives and things historical, um, were you, you know, was your great-great-grandmother a part of family lore? Did you know about her or did you discover her through, through searching? You know, I most I discovered her through searching. I would hear about um, her name was Clara, and I would hear about her growing up. But largely, um, and this kind of speaks to sort of like sort of my own um, 
largely like I didn't grow up, you know, knowing her or knowing about her really. Um, I would mostly just hear about her kind of in passing and had this desire to like know more. Um, but there was this disconnect um, and these gaps um, in that, you know, a lot of, you know, of the elders in my family passed at young ages or I didn't have relationships to them. And so I didn't have sort of access to familial knowledge, which I think is what really compelled and really is the source of what motivates me to like, you know, do this work is like wanting to having these like questions that I didn't have access to or that I didn't have answers for. Um, and so, um, yeah, those, the, the sort of lack of a connection or relationship or information is really what drove, what drives, you know, the practice and the process. Thank you. Um, Olashay, there, there are quite a few similarities between um, Kian's process and practice and your own, um, which I'd like to sort of get to in a few minutes. But could we start by, by talking about your, speaking of dirt, <laughs> your, next, your, your piece that's currently on exhibition at MOCA in Toronto as part of GTA 21 is called Plowing Through Liberty. Mm. Um, I don't know if you have any images um, that you could pull up. I do. I'm really bad at sharing screen, though. I never know how to get out of it. So, <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I'll put some images up. I already feel the resonance in the title of the word plowing. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you see my screen? Yeah, we see your screen. Okay, so if I enlarge this. Right, um, so Plowing Liberty um, is a body of work that fuses um, antique farm tools that I've sourced from the States and various provinces in Canada. And I fuse them with um, an, an antique hockey sticks. And I came to this work after a conversation I had with a lady called Miss Myrna in North Preston, which is Canada, one of Canada's oldest and largest Black communities. Um, they've been there since the 1700s. Nova and, Scotia. And yeah, just out in Nova Scotia, just outside of um, Halifax. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a community that are descendants of Black loyalists from New York, as well as Jamaican Maroons who were exiled um, to Canada. So essentially the British Crown placed them on this land because it was far removed from what would have been city life at the time. Um, and the land wasn't, it wasn't arable. So the idea was that it would sort of naturally pass, right? Um, and the story Miss Myrna told me was that the myth goes that her ancestors essentially dug their own graves in order, you know, continuously working the earth year after year, trying to make it arable. They essentially dug their own graves. And that really resonated with me. And at the same time, I had been interested in, um, oral histories from my family, and also how I could give a physical manifestation to these oral histories that I was collecting. Um, so fast forward three years, I found a hockey stick my neighbor had thrown out. And then I also, I took a couple of them, brought them back to my shed. And then I noticed they were about the same height as my garden tools. Um, and then something kind of went up in my head. It was like, how can I explore what it means to be Canadian in contemporary times, but putting that alongside the history of Blacks in this country and how, what they had to do, how they had to toil the earth in order to become Canadian, in order to establish themselves here. Um, I've always found that, you know, how, what it means to be Canadian has sort of been narrow, narrowly defined and it doesn't, as multicultural as we say we are, it doesn't encompass everyone. So like having hockey, for instance, as our national sport, you know, centers whiteness because hockey itself is predominantly a sport played by white communities. Um, but to me, I saw the labor and not just historically, but presently, I see labor as being, if not the greatest form of patriotism to, to a country. 
Um, and I guess in contemporary times, I'm also thinking about the Mexican and Jamaican seasonal workers who come here every year. Migrant and, workers. Yeah, the migrant workers. And many of them have been coming here as long as 20 years and haven't been able to become permanent residents. Um, so it's almost like they're, they're able to contribute to our society, to our culture, you know, to our vineyards. They ensure that our wineries reach their annual quotas. They put, you know, like our Ontario peaches on our tables, but they're not able to participate. Um, and I just feel like there couldn't be anything greater than like putting food on people's table, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's what the work is about in a nutshell. Um, I'm really interested in sort of um, addressing historical issues, but also how using the same body of work to address contemporary issues. Um, I mean, speaking of dirt, like a lot of these objects actually came from uh, some of the farms where Black loyalist families were settled. So I bought most of these objects from like elderly white folk mm -hmm. who have lived in those towns where Black and white loyalists were settled. So as I was making this work, I was, you know, imagine like what are the chances that this person could be a direct descendant of a white loyalist? And here I am like, you know, 300 plus years after making work about mm -hmm. this, um, this subject. Mm -hmm. So, so most of those tools are, are from Nova Scotia. There's some, some are from Nova Scotia, and but the majority of them are actually from Ontario. So the towns in Ontario where Black loyalists were settled. Okay. Yeah. Um, some of the objects are from the U.S. because I was also interested in mimicking the journey that um, the Black loyalists would have made from New York into Canada. Mm -hmm. So I mean, since like both of you are you know in these current works are really you know on a you know connect to a historical kind of journey um that's a that's 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 big that's that's national um but it's also very personal um so you talked a bit about the journey to this work but could you talk a bit about the journey to your practice so your current practice so what has brought you to this work, to this work as, as an artist um, at this time now? Yeah, it's a big question, but you know, take it away. <laughs> Absolutely, That's a, um, it's a great question and one that most immediately, um, the, the person in the words of a person um, who is, you know, on my mind today, who became an ancestor, Bell Hooks, um, tremendous yes. black feminist, writer, thinker, world builder. Um, one of her um, public talks that I was listening to and sitting with today was um, one entitled Transforming Pain into Power, mm -hmm. in which she, um, at the, it was a couple, uh, seven years ago, I believe it was, I'm not gonna attempt to do math, but um, a few years ago she was, um, a uh, scholar in residence at the New School, and she assembled a group of um, writers and thinkers for this particular panel um, to think about, um, you know, how people who, you know, experience immense amount of sort of structural violence and oppression um, sort of develop the imagination to live self-determined, um, expansive joy and purpose filled lives beyond and outside of, you know, a culture of domination that would have us live otherwise. Um, and um, I think, you know, that was, that is at what brought me to the work of becoming an artist, of being engaged in a practice that simultaneously um, considered some of, you know, the kind of structural and systemic um, violences that I'm interested in like redressing um, and engaging with, but also like, you know, on a personal, in my own kind of personal life and thinking about my creative practice as um, deeply rooted in a form of, as a kind of um, a healing practice, a practice of expanding and transforming, you know, my imagination um, um, such that, you know, I can be in the world in ways that are like vital 
um, and life affirming. Um, so my earliest works were public performances, um, one of which was entitled Unearthing, um, in which, um, in which, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, an early performance in what I would consider like one of my first fully realized works of art, um, you know, that kind of shifted me from being like a, um, um, creating in like very small intimate communities to like, you know, sharing my work more publicly. And in this performance, I am buried in a mound of earth and found sort of flora and other like kind of materials that I gathered um, in the street and I like transform my flesh using paint and glitter and kind of imagining myself to be this kind of like transhuman being. And as I'm undergoing this sort of process of transformation, um, I'm sort of unearthing stories and moments um, that were like seminal to um, my own journey of self-actualization as a, a Black queer person. And so, you know, the art making was always a way for me to either give language to or to, um, to find um, a visual language to engage with materials, um, um, to develop a process that um, ultimately was like first deeply rooted in, um, you know, me uh, answering those questions, who and how do I wanna be in the world? Um, how do I give voice to, um, give voice to give expression to, um, uh, to the possibilities of myself outside of, you know, or beyond a hegemonic gaze, a white cis het gaze, a colonial gaze, mm -hmm. um, and connecting with earth, touching it, the way it becomes sort of metaphor for like my own internal sense of interiority, but also like the way it sort of, um, um, helps me connect and think about what it means to be Black in the world, Black and queer and trans in the world are all, all kind of deep-seated elements of what drew me to, you know, becoming an artist. Thank you. Um, and for you, Olushe? Um, I think my current practice, um, it's very centered in the travel, like the travel is the art practice for me. Um, and I've been spending a lot more time on both sides of the Atlantic and I've been collecting mostly found rubber debris. Um, I actually coined a term called diasporic debris to describe the materials I've been collecting. Um, behind me, I have quite a few of these objects. Um, so I've probably been, I probably collected objects from about 16, 17 countries so far. Um, and what I'm doing is um, I've been trying to, well, I, I am reimagining the, um, the talismanic objects that Africans in the past, so enslaved people and Africans in present time are carrying with them on these journeys across the Atlantic. Um, and these would be objects that would offer some kind of spiritual protection, um, uh, comfort. So maybe something a family member might have made for them, um, but also objects that could hmm offer um, defense mm. so that could actually harm if there was a need to harm. So I, I'm really interested in, I guess, fusing what would otherwise be the dichotomy of like pain and pleasure with the object. Same thing with the farm tools and the hockey sticks. There's this idea of like, you know, the ice versus the soil and the rocky earth or the streamlinedness of a hockey stick versus the, um, you know, the jagged, uh, rugged edges of a, of a struggle or a rake, for instance. Um, so, I mean, I think, because I started as, as a painter primarily, 
And, but I've always traveled, I've always collected things. My mom actually would call me Wakajube, which in Nigeria means like wanderer. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until three years ago that I was like, wow, I've amassed so much stuff that I just collect because I enjoy it. So um, the collection wasn't, wasn't necessarily purposeful. No, I mean, or, or, or I you like collect with, with, the, with the notion of creating work in your head. I mean, I said I've collected things for over 10 years. So like a lot of these objects behind me, I had started collecting three years ago and I collect what I like, you know? Um, but it wasn't like officially until two years ago, I started to actively work with these things that I've been collecting all these years. Um, and specifically black rubber, I think, um, just the metaphor of what rubber is, like it's resilience, it's robust. And I was just thinking of the lives of black people, like going back and forth across the Atlantic. Um, and there are histories, for instance, the um, Jamaican Maroons who were exiled from Jamaica to, to Halifax, a group of them would eventually go to Sierra Leone. Some of them would get there and realize they actually would rather be back in Canada or back in Jamaica. So in one lifetime, they would have done that journey about four or five times, trying to you know, decide where it is they felt they, they belonged. Um, so likewise for me, I found that I'm a nomad, like I enjoy the travel mm -hmm. and like with my blackness, I, like I'm African, but I, I, there's something about being able to tap into the, the multitude of blackness, like the Caribbean, mm -hmm. um, the States, the Caribbean, um, South America, and these objects actually do that. So one, for instance, one object might say, for instance, that. And I picked this one because it has hair, and I know Keon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've actually been going, you know, picking up with black women's hair in the streets of the cities that I visit, right? Mm -hmm. And then I pair that with a found piece of uh, rubber, plastic, mm -hmm. and a metal accent. And mm -hmm. you know, there's some objects that have as many as six parts, and each part could have come from a different country or a different city. Mm -hmm. So it really is. I'm really looking at this idea of the black world being my oyster. I can go mm -hmm. to any of these places and find myself. Um, and that is worth a lot of Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting that, the, that there's hair, there's rubber, there's wood, that sort of mixed materials is also something that, that echoes or relates to, um, to fetish figures or, 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 or ceremonial figures. Yes. Um, from, from West Africa as well. Yeah, so I'm gonna share some images of, is my screen sharing right now? Yeah. Okay, so these are, this is a sample of um, objects that I've created using these uh, diasporic debris I've been collecting. And as I collect the objects, I'm also taking photos of them in sight. So I'm also saving a sort of like, um, I have the coordinates of where each object's been found. So there's also the potential of building like a uh, geographical database that mm -hmm. kind of maps all the places that I've been. But also if, you know, say someone was a Brazilian and Nigerian um, heritage, the intention is that I would have this database where you could go in and search for all the objects that um, are, all the objects that have parts from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Or if you wanted to see all the objects that had parts from Jamaica and Brazil, you could also do that. So the object in a sense becomes a representation of a person's um, place of origin. Mm -hmm. And are you, are you keeping those, those records? Yes, I have the coordinates of where all the objects are found. Okay. There's one in particular I want to get to. Yeah, that's probably one of my favorite ones. So I believe one of these combs I found in DC and then the other one I found, um, I live just north of Pelham Gardens and it's, a, it's an apartment building with like majority black population. So I do collect a lot of my objects from there. Yeah, so to date I've made probably about 300 of these um, and I'm actually, 
there's a, so there's 27 slave ships that are built in Canada. Um, a few of them actually sailed to Nigeria. Um, and there's one that was called Friendship. And there was 200 en enslaved people who were taken from uh, present day Nigeria to Montego Bay, Jamaica. Um, and so there'll be 208 of these objects, like what I've just shown and what's behind me in this vessel that will represent the lives of those people. So again, like this idea of travel is really like important, you know, to me. Okay. You're very you're beautiful and very graphic. I have, have, they on, have they been on exhibit yet? Or that's a show to come? That's a show to come next year. Okay. There's a, there's a selection of them at the at the Agnes at Queen's University right uh -huh. now. And you've also used used, I mean, to sort of reconnect to, to Kian's work and Kian's practice is is using earth um, in, in terms of your practice as well. Yeah. Talk about that a bit. Um I think with earth for me. It's also, it's, I'm interested in the, the patina. So like, for instance, I have the power figure for the American Negro, which is the Black Panther figure that I bury for a month. And like, you know, it, it gets covered in, um, in earth and then with the glue and all the other things I've collected, I add to that. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the similarities in earth from different places. So often I will collect something from Jamaica mm -hmm. and get something from Nigeria and trying to see like, can you really tell where the earth is from? Mm. You know, mm. um, that's something I'm interested in and I'm working on for future projects. Um, but there's something about like similar to Kion where you're taking soil from a place that has historic value to you and mm. bringing it into a different context. So like with some of these objects I brought, there's, there's soil from Jamaica on it, there's soil from Nigeria on it. And then mm -hmm. suddenly you're, you know, the mixing of the soils then becomes like a metaphor for the mixing of like the cultural mixing that is, that is happening between mm -hmm. these two places, right? Um, and this, you know, this could be like transfer of food knowledge, for instance, is one thing that I'm interested in. Um, you, you've both spoken ab about earth, because I asked, um, and the use of for found objects and ephemera. Um, I guess talk to us about about the the role or the function of of blackness and queerness, blackness and transness, blackness and and gender exploration um, in your work, um, Kian. Before we get to that, I have a question I want to ask. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That I'm so in, I'm always curious to hear from other like makers, but particularly um, artists who like develop a kind of unique relationship to a material. Like, what attracts you to that material? How do you work with it? I'm curious about like I'm interested in this idea of like co like collection as a, a certain type of care, but I'm curious like you know um, when you're working with like the objects that you collect or that you find. Um, and thinking about like material knowledge, like mm -hmm. do the process of like collecting something and transforming it into, you know, through your own process and practice. It like, what is, does, is anything revealed to you? Or like, what is like, is there a relationship between you and your materials that kind of like unfolds while you're mm -hmm. like, you know, from the process of like collecting something, bringing it back to the studio, living with it, and then, you know, touching it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, the the objects have become a kind of like process of journaling because I stopped keeping a diary like maybe five, ten years ago, maybe seven years ago, and and I was worried because I was like I used to write every day and I just I just don't do it. And then I realized that there was a point where I was making one of these objects every day, mm -hmm. and in a sense that became how I was personally connecting to my work or sort of like keeping like. Uh, chronology of like you know my daily life my practice how it's how it's evolving as well um, and then because I take photos of these objects when I find them I can also make that connection um, to where the object was found the date it was found and then how I'm now using it and on what day I finish the piece mm -hmm. um, 
but a lot of these come back with me in my suitcase, in my pocket. Um, sometimes I'll like take one out with me now just because they're, they're small enough and I kind of enjoy that process of people being like, oh, what are you working on? And it's like, oh, I have this, like mm. the sample of what I'm working on. And because I'm sort of recreating what these talismanic objects would have been, you know, they're small enough where you can carry them with you. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I have a very, very personal <laughs> relationship with, with all of them. Um, you know, just the excitement of when you find an object that you're like, that's coming back home with me, you know? Um, and then after a while you've, you know, you kind of feel like you've seen everything, but then something will surprise you. Um, and then that way each object becomes memorable. Yeah, do, you have a, do you have a similar relationship to, to objects in your work? Um, totally. I mean, I do in that, like, I have, like, I'm attracted to very specific materials that, like, mm -hmm. you know, that I want to first touch through, like, 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 with my hands, but also that, like, are embedded with either, like, historical or political or, like, a, a social resonance that I want to, um, intervene on, explore, um, but in my like ongoing exploration with like earth and soil, um, you know, the relationship is, is many fold. In one hand, I'm like, you know, um, I'm always or, like part of my fascination is like, how do I get it to like defy gravity and take form and shape in ways that, you know, it doesn't in how we encounter like earth in our daily lives, right? Um, and so part of it is just like, you know, me just like problem solving and exploring and experimenting with it as like a sculptural form. Um, and then also, you know, there's something about um, through the process of like sculpting, touching, manipulating, shaping um, um, earth, um, you know, they're just like certain, like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Revelation, revelations are like, yeah, revelations that just kind of, you know, arrive or emerge through the process. Like something that I meditate a lot on when I'm sculpting is like, earth is such a um, tricky and interesting and sometimes potentially challenging material to like, Mm -hmm. three-dimensional objects with um, because it naturally just does not want to um, hold, right? It just wants to like fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, and so the process of getting it to take shape is like one that both requires like a kind of like consistent and persistent like touch, like me like caring for it in a, in a particular kind of way. Um, but like a kind of touch that is like firm but gentle because if I'm like mm. touching it too hard it'll like fall apart yeah. it won't take the shape that I want um or um but it has to be firm and like repetitive in order to like um in order to sculpt it and so like these are like the kinds of I guess like I would think of it as like a kind of material or like haptic research in terms mm -hmm. of like what do you learn from like about yourself or um through like this process of like touching something being in such close proximity to it um yeah so i'm always curious about like you know sculptors working with their materials and in both cases it's 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 touching experiencing but also transforming mm -hmm. you know whether it's earth or the um found objects pair um it it's it's taking something that's that's there in one state and then recreating it or transforming it into something else i think is interesting and okay as time is time is go ahead Holy and i was just gonna say the other thing it's like it's the smell like that's okay. part of the connection to the things i work with um it's just that rubber smell mm -hmm. but also sometimes the smell of the place the object was found right so like the other day I pulled out, I've collected like strips from um, the Senegalese fishing boats. Mm -hmm. and I, I've had it for about four months. And then the other day I was like, you know, let me maybe start working with these. And like, 
the smell was just like, wow, I'm back in Senegal. Did you um, smell sea? Was it salt? What did it, you it smells like, see, yeah, it does, but it's also like the lining is sort of like a, it's like melted rubber. So it has that rubber smell as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's the sea salt and there's the fish. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's a very, it's a very, you know, and I think when I use this in work, like that's going to be part of the experience. It's like people will go see this and they could be transported to me being in that fishing boat in the Atlantic, right? Um, in the last few minutes, um, just a few, I guess a few minutes from each of you on, on, on the role of, of Blackness and queerness or gender identity, gender expression in, in, in your works. Okay, I guess, um, I mean, I've explored this in several different ways, but I think I'll talk about one of the ways I want to explore it moving forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've actually been working on this thing where I'm, you know, creating the uh, aesthetic of a, a queer Yoruba masquerade. Um, in Yoruba is there culture, such a thing? There, there isn't such a thing, mm -hmm. but before like colonization, queer Yorubas were revered as the shamans and the people who had greater power to connect to spiritual energies. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case anymore. You know, I mean, queer, queer people still are, but not as revered in like present times because of colonization mm -hmm. and, you know, Christianity. So I, I'm interested in, you know, doing work around that. Like, what would, what would that aesthetic be like? Mm -hmm. And will this be like, will Nigerians accept a queer masquerade? And like, you know, yeah, it's still something I'm, I'm figuring out, but it's work that I'm very, very interested in. Like, I think of the work of Rotimi Fani Kayode, and I, you know, he did some of this type of work. Um, but so Rotimi Fani Kayode was um, um, Nigerian? Nigerian, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. British um, photographer. Yeah. Who yeah. like, you know really like reconciled his sexuality with his blackness mm -hmm. and um, being of Yoruba heritage. Um, so yeah, that's that's work that I'm definitely interested in. Um, and I think that you know with this series, Aminado, there's sort of like an S and M like undertone in the work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also as I explore this idea of like pain and pleasure and how an object can be both of those things at the same time. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I remember from your, your previous show at Patel, um, yeah. some of the objects, the rubber objects were, were almost like objects you'd used in, in, in um, role playing and fetish play and had some of that kind of um, flavor to it as well. Yeah, but, you know, but they were, act they were actually inspired by the Yoruba fly whisk that the kings and like queens <laughs> would have. Um, but I was interested in like sort of reinterpreting in reinterpreting them as these objects that also had like a sort of sexual curiosity mm -hmm. to them. Thank you. Kian? Um, I think about my relationship to like both blackness and queerness and um, gender transgression um, through like a lens of like, um, through a lens of sort of embodiment and metaphor. And by that, I mean, like I often, um, uh, I think about the ways that I work with materials as kind of a metaphor for black and trans life. Um, sort of conceptually, one of the sort of frameworks of that is like thinking about working with materials that are like imbued with a certain kind of meaning, inherent meaning and in working with them to like transform that, that sort of assumed meaning or um, sort of collecting and intervening um, and working with materials considered like abject or disposable mm -hmm. and sort of collecting them and working with them and saying that like actually these materials are like life-giving and vital and um, um, you know all of those things so like um, on the level of 
uh, I think those are the ways that like my work kind of sort of engages with, you know, what it means to be a black queer being. Mm. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a process. Right, a right. Process. And I'm hearing, I'm hearing reclamation and I'm hearing mm. care. Yes. <laughs> reclamation, I'm, care and transformation. Absolutely. I'm gonna write that down. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I think, I think those are, those are themes that run throughout the work of, of both of you as, as artists. So, um, is this the point where we would take any questions? Are there any questions? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Perfect, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so maybe as we come to a close, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them below. I mean, thank you all. It's such a wonderful discussion. And I mean, there are so many connections between your work. Maybe I can even start with a question of my own. You know, I find there's this really interesting maybe dynamic between your work, Oloche, how it's like objects pulled from the land and from the earth that have maybe been in some ways decayed and transformed over time. And then looking toward Kion's work that, you know, in opposition is itself rising from the earth and almost growing and kind of experiencing this like rebirth from the work. Maybe you could both speak to kind of that duality between your works as well. No, it's kind of a broad <laughs> way to jump in, maybe not easy. <laughs> um, I mean, I think they both seem to me like forms of monument building, right? Yes. Um, a lot of monuments, when we think of monuments, we think of them as things that are built up, right, typically. Yes. Um, but a lot of African monuments are actually built down. So there's like ditches mm -hmm. that you know, were built to protect cities, right? Um, so like, I see this work as some kind of monument, you know, like when you have 300 of these together in a room to honor 300 lives, that's a monument to those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the things between Keon and I's work is that we're making monuments with things that have been discarded, like things that people don't, you know, take for granted, um, but to like sort of breathe new life into, you know, into soil and into like found rubber and like erect these monuments that are not traditional at all, but, um, you know, are, are addressing very important things, um, I think is great. Like I love Keon's work. <laughs> um, yeah, similarly, I'm so excited to like learn more and see more about your work. Um, in a way that um, I'm still, I need to think and sit and write through it, but um, there's a way that like part of the material is also like time and history mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and movement and change. Um, and, and that seems to be like, um, um, what is also like, you know, coming to the fore and being transformed you know in the process um in ways that i find you know really exciting wonderful and it seems um, like you're... any of you want to talk about you, you spoke a bit uh Oshie, about some of the things that are percolating in terms of your head in terms of uh um work um, Kian, or is there a work in progress that you would want to talk about or an upcoming exhibition um, that you think would be worth mentioning to folks? Um, absolutely, totally. Um, um, speaking of like monuments and in ditches and building monuments up and down, mm. um, I'm working towards um, a public art project in New York City um that i can't talk about too specifically but that will engage with things of monumentalism um and that um will debut in the spring in may um and it's a group exhibition with public art fund um called black atlantic mm -hmm. um and then i also have my first solo show um that will be also in new york in LA um, at a gallery called Lows and King, and then simultaneously a 
show or in New York um, called Lows and King and then simultaneously a show um, in LA um, at the Hammer Museum that'll be kind of a distillation of some of the works that I've been um, kind of an extension of the work that's on view at the Visual Arts Center, um, but um, kind of expanded in different ways. But all of that um, is emerging this spring that I'm very actively working on right now. Cool, thank you. And when's, when's the show in New York? The show in New York is, I have my calendar right here, um, May, um, May 13th and May 17th are the two opening dates for the shows in New York, um, which uh, you are all invited to and would love <laughs> to, um, you know, host you and have you there if you are able to make it. I... I accept that invitation. <laughs> <laughs> and Olishe is always in New York. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what about you, Olushe? Anything that you'd like to, to highlight or share? Um, so I'm actually, will be showing my first film project or moving image, I should say, um, in April of next year. Um, and it's, it's an experimental short film that, you know, explores my ideas of Blackness in Canada. So I traveled across the country for three years, back and forth, um, collecting some of these objects, um, meeting Miss Myrna, who inspired the work at MOCA. Um, and then there's a short film that will, that has come out of that journey. Um, so that's with TPW Gallery in Toronto. And then I do have my solo um, in September, um, tentatively called Black Exodus, um, again, which is based on the things I've created, the ideas that have come up for my travels in the last three years. Um, so again, everything is very heavily based in the travel. <laughs> um, yeah, and then in, I think it's in, it opens in March. Um, I'm in a group show at the Albright Knox um, Museum in Buffalo. Nice. Um, and I'm also going to be building totems using found objects. Um, for that show? Yeah, for that show, yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so sounds like there's lots to look forward to um, from both of you in the new year. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, being in, in conversation with you both. And um, thank you to the VAC for hosting this um, talk, this conversation, um, and also um, Kian's installation. Um, uh, so. awesome. Thank you both. And, thank um, you. Thanks, VAC. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And um, before we conclude, I want to give my thanks as well to the three of you, Kian, Lachea, Courtney, um, for your powerful insights this evening and for sharing your work as well. Um, I myself will definitely be continuing our reflections on um, artifacts and transformation and the stories we can pull from the earth and from the shores. And um, it was so nice to um, hear you speak to so many of these points. And um, we're very grateful as well to our audience joining us at home. Um, so in closing, I'd like to say that although we're very sad to see this exhibition come to a close, Bodies in Conflict, curated by Matthew Kaiba here at the VAC, um, featuring Khan's work, Kian's work, I encourage you to kind of keep your eyes peeled to our social media as we share this recording in the future and some other reflections on our 2021 exhibition programming from the past year. Um, we really look forward to welcoming you all back on site, hopefully with new exhibitions in 20 in 2022 and in January um, so thank you again everyone um, take care stay well this holiday season